Uh, our, the third uh, of our panelists uh, this morning um, is uh, Evelyn Hu Dehart. Uh, Evelyn's um, substantive uh, position is as a professor at uh, Brown University in the USA, but this year uh, she's a, a visiting uh, professor uh, in the uh, history program here at NTU. And Evelyn's going to talk about the Manila uh, galleon trade. So, uh, Evelyn, please. Thank you. I want to thank um, uh, Andrea Nanetti for discovering me here at NTU, which has enabled me to be a part of this wonderful, wonderful conference. And uh, as Angelo said, I've learned so much from all of you. And it's just, uh, this is what I found so uh, stimulating being here in Singapore. Uh, I find the United States so parochial in comparison to little Singapore. So I want to thank Singapore for being so much more cosmopolitan and globally connected. Sometimes I think our very size and power and wealth works against us in the United States because all too often we're content just to speak to each other. And here in Singapore, I've had a chance to meet many, many more wonderful, interesting scholars and uh, just public intellectuals, students uh, from all over the world. So I thank you all for that. Well, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to take off where Professor Abulafa uh, left off yesterday with his brief mention of the Manila galleon trade and the Pacific Ocean, which uh, I guess uh, when Frau Mauro um, it drew up his Mapa Mundi, Mundo, he, they didn't know about the Pacific Ocean. So uh, today I'm going to add to this uh, cosmography and talk a little bit about the um, Pacific Ocean. So I've titled my talk, The Manila Galleon, The Forgotten Silk Road of the Spanish American Empire. I would like to add a, 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 something more to this already very long title because I also want to pay a little bit of attention to the Chinese of Manila because the Chinese who went to Manila and settled Manila uh, were um, absolutely indispensable to the Spanish-American or the Mexican project. I say Mexican throughout this talk because I want to emphasize that it's about America and Asia and uh, the Spanish-American empire. Uh, the, the crown of the Spanish-American Empire was the Viceroyalty of New Spain, normally more commonly known as Mexico. So I will keep saying Mexico uh, instead of Spanish America. You will hear that, all right? And uh, so the Chinese of Manila who were attracted to Manila and settled in Manila were indispensable to this Mexican Trans-Pacific project. So I want to pay attention to the Chinese, and I also want to pay tribute to the Chinese here in Singapore because it's the very same Hokkien people from Quanzhou that you heard about yesterday, Chaitong, from Xiamen, from uh, Zhangzhou, and from that area of southern Fujian who mainly settled Manila in the Ming Dynasty and who enabled the Mexicans to carry on this incredible trans-Pacific commercial trade system for 250 years without break, from 1565 to 1815. So let's move on. So um, I start out with these four propositions, the history of the Chinese in Manila and the trade with Mexico of the Spanish-American Empire was the first authentic globalization in world history. Second, the Chinese were indispensable to the Mexican enterprise in Manila. Without the Chinese, the Mexicans would not have been able to carry out the Manila Galleon trade, a trans-Pacific commercial enterprise for 250 years. Exchanging American silver for Chinese silks and other fine goods. And without the Chinese, the Mexicans could not have survived in this far-flung border town with China on the edge of the Spanish-American empire. Keep that in mind. The Mexican, the Manila Chinese community can be considered the first American Chinatown, for Manila was an extension of Mexico in the Americas. So here I am aggressively intervening in what we call Asian American history, which normally narrates the beginning of Asia and America with the arrival of tens of thousands of Chinese gold uh, mine workers 
and railroad workers in the 19th century, but I'm going to now assert that that happened many centuries before, the contact between China and America and the uh, presence of Chinese in America. Moreover, China, Manila became the first and biggest permanent overseas Chinese settlement beginning in the 16th century, thus marking the beginning of the Chinese diaspora, the idea of Luo Di Shengen putting down roots. So these are the four propositions. Now, there were several European maritime enterprises to Asia in the late 15th and early 16th century that I'm sure all of you or most of you are familiar with, but let me just recap them very quickly. We have Christopher Columbus, of course, in 1492, uh, in which he, quote, discovered America for the Europeans. In 1497, Vasco da Gama, who was alluded to earlier, sailed from Portugal to India by going around Africa. Then in 1519 to 22, Magellan and Elcano circumnavigated the globe. Magellan himself was killed on Cebu Island of what would later on be called, be called Las Filipinas, but Elcano did make his way back home to Spain. And so he was the first person to have traveled all three great oceans, the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian Ocean. Another set of lesser known but equally important expeditions took off from Mexico, which was already colonized by Spain, took off from Mexico between 1522 and 44. These three expeditions went from Mexico to the Malaccas, the Spice Island, and gathered a lot of information crossing the Pacific, which will come in very handy very soon. So here's just quickly the map that shows you the, which again we talked about, right, from the Portuguese sailing around uh, the Cape of Africa and then all the way into the Indian Ocean world and into the Nanyang world, no? into China and uh, here in Southeast Asia. Here I put together this map, this world map. My student actually did it to show the three parts of the, of the, the um, main parts of the story that I'm telling, starting here in China and the Philippines. This is Mexico, of course. And if you notice, Mexico was far, far larger and this will come into play in my narrative, much larger than Mexico is today because at that time and until 1848, until the middle of the 19th century, Mexico, both as a colony of Spain and then independent Republic of Mexico, actually owned half of the United States. All the states of California, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona were all part of Mexico until the United States took it over in 1848. So Mexico was far larger, and, and as I said, this will be an important part of my story if I have enough time to tell you about it. And of course, here is Spain and the rest of Europe and um, Africa, okay? So that's why this is the first Trans-Pacific round trip. Okay, wait a minute, let me go. The next year, in, in 1565, Legaspi dispatched, uh, wait a minute, Sorry, I skipped this one. After Columbus, Spain colonized Mesoamerica, and then the, the, the crown uh, commissioned a, what I call, a person I call Mexican because he had already lived in Mexico for 35 years. His name was Miguel Lopez de Legazpi. He was dispatched by the crown to the Philippines in 1564 because they were already aware of the Portuguese lurking around in the neighborhood and Spain wanted to lay claim to this. So he took with him other Mexicans, including a very important person, an Augustinian monk and a brilliant navigator called Andres de Urdaneta. They left from Acapulco, Mexico on the Pacific coast. And uh, the next year, the very next year after they arrived in Cebu Island, Legazpi dispatched Urdaneta to return to Acapulco across the Pacific on a galleon laden with Chinese and Asian luxury items bought with the American silver that Legazpi had brought with him. And Urdaneta then succeeded in making the first circumnavigation or round trip voyage of the Pacific, you see? So this is the 1865. So Urdaneta returned to Acapulco by sailing back across the Pacific and this is the first time this was done. And this would cut the trip then from um, America to Asia, no? 
without having to go around the other oceans. It's very important. This, here I found a 1575 map about the circumnavigation of the Pacific. This is a very old map, 1575, no? by Juan Lopez de Velasco. Then in 1571, Legacy built Manila on the big island of Luzon to be the capital. Now, I want to just give you a few quotes to, sh to show you how the Spaniards and uh, people of the times thought about this great Pacific Ocean. William Schertz, who wrote the still classic book on the Manila Galleon, had this to say. He said, a Spanish Orient might be made an adjunct of Spanish America. Spain developed its relationship with Las Filipinas through one of its American colonies, so the galleon trade was an intercolonial trade. Contemporary maps envisioned the West Indies extending all the way to Las Filipinas. Look at this map. This is a map reproduced in your program, but I think it was slightly mislabeled because if you can read the top of the map, it was actually made in 1601. 1601, and if you look at this map, the very title says Las Indias Occidentales, which means the West Indies. And the West Indies, in the imagination of the Mexican and the Spaniards, extended clear across the Pacific. Though the Spaniards lay claim to the Pacific, no? As part of the West Indies, as part of America. And that's why I and others have called, I'm calling the, the Manila as a, board, as a border between Spain, no, Mexico, and China. Okay. Here's another uh, older map, 1771, just to show you that that imagination continued well into the 18th century. This is another map called the Oceano, Oceano Asiatico. This depicts the Gulf of California, the Pacific on the other side, on the American side, and yet this map was labeled the Asian Ocean. No? So, so this is the Asia Pacific in the imagination, in the world view. Here are just some common pictures uh, uh, of the uh, Chinese junks, uh, also referred to. And here is the, um, these are the cities which we are familiar with, so I won't dwell on them. Now here I want to, yeah, I won't dwell on them, the, the southern Fujian cities. Now this is important because this is a description by a Jesuit already well into the trade, mentioning, and I put it in red, all the places that were involved in the commercial trade, in the goods that were taken across the Pacific. And you name, you can see it's not only the Orient and the Occident, Peru and New Spain, which were the main producers of the silver that was used to trade, but also all these pearls and precious stones of places called Narsinga and Goa, which is of course in India, and then places like Ceylon and Sumatra, um, uh, uh, spice Islands, and then from Great China, silks of all kinds. And what kind of silk? This is just one description of the kind of silks that the Europeans, the Mexicans were already uh, tr uh, uh, coveting. And this is a kind of silk that they were exporting from China through Manila, because that's what the Manila Chinese uh, junk traders did. They carried the goods in voluminous amounts from China to Manila, and then from Manila they were loaded onto the galleon ships, and then the galleon ships would cross the Pacific to Acapulco. So this is just, I won't go into that in the, in the interest of time, but to show you that they were already so familiar with Chinese silk and all the different qualities of Chinese silk and other kinds of textiles, and they could describe it with such rich detail. And these are the galleon ships, of course. They are huge galleon ships that were used uh, in this trade. Here's um, Acapulco on the Mexican side, on the Mexican Pacific side. This is an old 1628 painting showing how the galleon ship is arriving in Mexico, and here's the lookout. And as soon as the ships arrived, well, you had the great Acapulco Fair, the Feria de Acapulco, with literally hundreds if not thousands of merchants from all over the Americas would gather to either take the goods that they had commissioned already or to buy things off the ship. And then they would, these goods would be taken by land called the Camino de Chino, the Chinese road from Acapulco all the way to Mexico City when the big major square of Mexico City would have its parian or its fair uh, selling the Chinese goods. So here we have then the, uh, the connection then, the trade 
from Manila, which engaged not only the, the goods from China, but Narsinga, Goa, uh, all the way across the Indian Ocean. So the traders, the Hokkien traders, the Fujian traders of Manila connected China and connected the Indian Ocean to the Mexican merchants of Manila, who then would take the goods across the Pacific to Acapulco. Then they would be transshipped by land to a port on the Pacific side, on the Caribbean side, called Veracruz. And from Veracruz, these things would be transported to Spain, and from Spain all over Europe and maybe North Africa as well. Here I will just quickly show that here they build the Intramuros, the, the Spanish city inside the walls, and then the Chinatown. This is what I want to tell you about, the, the Chinatown, which was outside the city walls. No, the Chinese were forbidden to live inside the city walls. Here is a, a earlier painting of the same thing with the Chinese junk ships sailing up the Pasig River around the city wall and into Chinatown or the Parian. Now, how many, how many people were we talking about? 500 to 1,000 maybe, Spanish or Mexicans, hmm? mostly consisting of five categories, government officials, administrators, settlers, uh, uh, conquistadores, that is the first generation of settlers, priests and the missionary soldiers, officers, merchants, and businessmen. There were also a smattering of other foreigners like the Portuguese. The Japanese also had a very small community there as well. Um, but who were the other people? Uh, the Chinese. The Chinese grew very rapidly from about 150 at the point of first contact in Cebu in 1564 uh, to around then to uh, 10,000 by 86. 25,000 by the end of the century, and by 1603, 30,000, and an estimated 85% of them were Hokkien. And uh, these are just some general descriptions of, of the Chinese, which from the very beginning uh, reflected a real ambivalence about the Chinese. Uh, first, they were considered um, handsome people. No, they were white, tall, little facial hair. I think that's really funny from a Chinese perspective that, uh, that the Europeans noticed that the Chinese had little facial hair because the Chinese noticed just the opposite, that the Europeans had too much facial hair. No, you know what we call the foreigners, right? So we noticed that the opposite, they all noticed this, this uh, facial hair problem, lack, lack of it or too much of it. And, but this is another interesting thing that the Europeans, uh, the Mexicans and Europeans noticed, that the Chinese were strong, they were good workers, and they were skilled in arts and crafts. This would become extremely important. But at the same time, the ambivalence that the Chinese were people of low energy, traitorous, and cruel, even with their own people, and this last one, and very greedy, okay? So here are some, uh, uh, um, some uh, early paintings of the Chinese who were called Sanglei. Sanglei is a term that they adopted from the local Filipino, the local, the late natives. Sanglei comes from the Hokkien word Xiong Lai, which means to come and go frequently, because that's what the junk traders did before the Spaniards arrived. They didn't stay permanently on these islands. They came and went as they did throughout the Nanyang area, the South Seas, and throughout the Indian Ocean. And for the first time, they were induced to stay more permanently, as you will see. But here, very briefly, is another depiction of a Chinese. This is a Christianized Chinese. Then he could wear Western clothes. He could cut his hair. No? The Chinese themselves began to notice. This is a very important book called the Dongxi Yang Kao, which we have at Brown University, one of the original copies, but it has been reproduced over the years, here at NTU, at NUS, every major library in the world has a reproduction, probably. And this is what this chronicle of the countries of the East and West Oceans, Dong Xi Yang Kao, published in 1617, said, the Chinese who visit Luzon, Luzon is a big island where Manila is located, are consequently many. They often stayed on and did not return, and they call this Yadong to pass the winter. They stay together in the Gyeongne, the it, it, up the river, which is a Hokkien name for the Parian, the Chinatown, to make their living, and their numbers gradually rose to several tens of thousands. One hears that some cut their hair, because they're Christianized, 
and produce sons and grandsons. This is from the Chinese who were also noticing this phenomenon of Chinese not coming back and staying permanently overseas. Oh. The other thing I want to show you very quickly, and again, I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but in, in addition to all those beautiful luxury items for the galleon trade itself, the Mexicans on the ground were noticing too, and making note of this, that the Chinese from uh, Hokkien, from Minan, were bringing over all kinds of everyday use items and everyday food items, no? including cage birds, some of which talk while others sing. No? It's a very thing that the Europeans, the Mexicans found very charming. So what does this all mean? It means that the, the Spaniards and the Mexicans depended on the Chinese for their everyday living. Without these sangles, the city would not be able to survive and sustain itself because they are the master of all crafts, hardworking people. And here's another refrain we will keep hearing over and over again from the 16th century to the present day. They charge reasonable prices, meaning that things are cheap and good. These articles have already begun to be manufactured here. And this is why they stayed. Instead of just bringing the things from China, what these artisans from China did, from Minan did, was to actually come to Manila and stay there and open up their little shops and businesses and manufacturers and start manufacturing these things. And as you will see very quickly, not just then for local use, but for export, including many that went on the galleon ships. So in this parian are to be found workmen of all trades and handicrafts of a nation, and many of them in each occupation. They make much prettier articles than are made in Spain, and sometimes so cheap that I am ashamed to mention it. This is a remark by the bishop, the first bishop of Manila. Okay, so they have doctors, they have uh, restaurants. Here's another great thing. You know, I, I, as I was doing this research, you know, I keep chuckling to myself because I'm looking at documents from the 16th century by the first generation of Spaniards who, who went there to live and work and intermingle with the Chinese, and they were making observations that resonate to this very day. No, not only about the Chinese being skilled artisans, being able to make anything and make them cheaper and good quality, but look at this. They like to eat in Chinese restaurants. This is the beginning of Chinese restaurants, right? They go to the Chinatown, eating houses where sangles and Spaniards eat. Um, clothes and shoes in Spanish fashion and low prices. So they quickly learn to make things to meet the demand, you know, to meet the taste and the, and the requirements. Silversmiths and painters, religious images copied from Spaniards, bookbinders, gardeners raising good vegetables. Where would we be in Southeast Asia without the chili from the Americas? No? Chili, tomatoes, potatoes, all of these American products, yams, sweet potato, maize or maize, no? corn, et cetera, et cetera. So these gardeners who are bringing these crops, so I, I am thinking, I, I speculate, I think there may be others who do the same, that many of these new world food items and crops probably went to Manila first, and then from Manila they went all over Asia and China, no? And artisans, and et cetera. So, and then bakers, bakers who make bread according to the Western taste because they brought wheat. They did not grow wheat in the Philippines, but they brought wheat from China and they made bread. And then the bakers were the only group given the exception. They were allowed to live in Tramuros, inside the city wall, because they have to get up so early to make the bread and deliver the bread to the Spaniards. No? They had to let, let them live inside the city walls. But here's another point I want to point out. That is another recurring characteristics of Chinese overseas. They would give bread to poor soldiers on credit when they have no money. The extension of credit is a characteristic common throughout the Chinese diaspora. Little Chinese shopkeepers in every little town and corner with their clients who often live hand to mouth or workers and low-income people, when they run out of cash at the end of the month, the Chinese shopkeeper would say, just take this on credit and I'll make a note of it. You can see that this practice was already uh, uh, widespread in, in the, at that time. And who were the Chinese giving credit to? To the Spanish soldiers who were not being paid by the, by the colonial government in time. No, their pay or their pay couldn't last them through the end of the month. 
okay? And Chinese artisans, okay. And then they also began to learn how to build ships, the big galleon ships. I have uh, the young men distributed to you, so I don't. I, I won't go. I won't uh, go into the. But a 1689 census listing all the non-Christian Chinese occupations in the Parian, just to give you an idea of how many uh, services and goods and things that the Chinese were producing. There, there are about 60 occupations listed here, and this is a picture of the Parian. No, a very bristling, lively uh, uh, place. Um, Okay, here is what, I, I, I love this because since being in Southeast Asia, it makes even more sense. I call these the first hawker stand. You think you have hawkers here in Singapore. Well, they had it in Manila, no? Maybe even before Singapore. And these are the hawker stands. Can, they should look very familiar. Can you see them? No? Uh, uh, serving food, here's another hawker stand, no? Serving noodles on the streets and making other kinds of food to, for poor people. Here's something else too that we begin to see. The bishop said, what arouses my wonder most is when I arrived here, the Sangle hardly knew how to paint anything, meaning paint in, as, as portraiture, paint. But now they have so perfected themselves in this art that they produce marvelous work with both the brush and the chisel. And look at this beautiful, beautiful painting. This is in the Nuestra Señora de Pronto Socorro. Our Lady, uh, a, a, a church in the, in the Binondo area. Binondo is where the, the converted Chinese could live, and today it is the Manila Chinatown. When you go to Manila, you want to go to Chinatown? Ask to go to the Binondo. And this painting hangs in the church. It was painted around 1585 by a Chinese who was taught to paint the Western way. So I show you this example. So the significance then of Manila's Parian Chinatown, first American Chinatown, because Manila, the Philippines, was part of Mexico, part of America, indispensable to the Manila galleon trade, and as a first truly large Chinese community overseas, and easily the largest one in the 16th century, it can be said to mark the beginning of the Chinese diaspora. So these are my three propositions, in addition to the fourth one, which I uh, talked about very early on, I will be done soon, and, and that one is about the globalization, connecting the world through the three oceans. No, early on, just want to remind you, Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, the three great oceans of the world connected through the Manila Galleon trade. No? Every inhabited part of the world was touched by this one commercial system. All was not going well, however, because the Chinese became too powerful, too successful, and that created fear and anxiety on the part of the, of the Mexicans and the Spanish. I won't go into this, we have no time. I just want to tell you that because I don't want you to think that everything was always harmonious between the two groups. No? There were recurrent patterns of destruction and the rebuilding of the Parian. 1603, a huge massacre, the report said 25,000 Chinese were massacred and the rest were sent back to China. Expelled the party and closed down, it burned. But guess what? Within a few months, the Spaniards, the Mexicans in Manila realized we can't make it without the Chinese. Who's gonna bring us a merchandise for the next galleon that comes? Who's gonna keep us uh, fed and well clothed? So they called the Chinese to come back. The Chinese came back and built the party on. And this would be a recurrent pattern. So these 1603, 1639, 1662, 1668, these just in the 17th century. These are the um, years in which there was huge massacre and destruction of the Chinese, and then they would come back and rebuild. Okay, so let me just finish with, with a few more slides. I don't want to leave you, though, without giving you some idea of how much silver went from America to China, the significance of this trans-Pacific trade. It's not merely the Silk Road. That's important. But of course, the Chinese and the Hokkien merchants would not be induced to stay in Manila and trade with the Mexicans if, they, if there was nothing they wanted from America. And indeed, they wanted something very, very valuable, which is American silver mined in both Mexico and in the other Spanish colony of Peru. So much silver was taken to China that we think more than half of the silver mined and coined in America ended up in 
in China, no? not just through Manila, but later on through other trade routes as well. So here is just some idea of how much um, in the legal trade, because there was a lot of contraband trade. No? So averaging 2 million pesos or 50 tons of pure silver through the 17th century alone, and it will continue. Okay, so what's the significance of silver? It became the first world currency. I read in here in Singapore documents all the time. Yes, I'll be done. About the silver that uh, circulated all over Asia, at least, uh, and it's a currency for the trade. Finally, here's an example of the silver we're talking about, the silver, the Chinese printing presses that were used to produce our first Tagalog dictionary in uh, uh, 1610 and uh, the books that were first printed in 1593 by Dominican Fry, who translated back and forth. He learned Chinese very quickly. He translated books from Spanish to Chinese and Chinese to Spanish. No, I, sorry, I don't have time to tell you more about these books, but um, just finishing up with, because part of this conference is about heritage, so I don't want to forget the heritage. I want to tell you that China is in the Americas and staring everybody in the face every day because Chinese goods are ubiquitous. They are everywhere in America, it's, but it's hidden in plain sight because people have forgotten this history and they forget that they're looking at Chinese goods every day to this present day. Just to give you some examples, the Chinese writing desk made by a Chinese artisan, art, artwork, no, Ceramics, and look at this one. This is made by a, a Mexican artisan taught by a Chinese artisan. So he made the typical blue and white plate, but he put the cathedral in the back, in the back to, 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 as his own personal um, design. No? So these are other examples. Uh, okay, I just want to show you very quickly what silk meant. Silk was the single largest merchandise that was taken to America. And you see these in every museum, every museum. Next time you go to a museum in the Americas and Europe and you see a fine lady dressed like this, what you're looking at is Chinese silk. People don't know that. And, and, and the caption would not necessarily tell you that, but this is an example of Chinese silk. Because you have to wonder, what did they do with all the Chinese silk? Chinese tapestry, Chinese silk. This is another painting, no? Typical Chinese silk, you see? Chinese silk on the men, too. Hmm? Tapestry, woven. And then finally, a series of ivory religious objects that is in every church in Latin America, in Mexico, and probably in Europe as well. Anytime you see an ivory religious object in a church, it's probably from Manila that came through this trade. Look, Christ on the cross, all made by Chinese artisans made out of ivory. See? These are all ivory objects. No? And then also uh, using archaeology, finding out the shirts or the, the bowls made, and then Chinese painting. And finally, look at cultural syncretism when cultures meet. We know about the Virgin Mary, no? You know, Virgin Mary, she always carries a baby, right? This is a Virgin Mary um, 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 made by a um, Chinese or Filipino craftsman and is made of ivory. But look how the craftsmen transformed it in art and in ivory. They began to merge the Guan Yin with the Madonna. So this is a Madonna, but the Madonna decidedly looks Asian, no? So this is a Guan Yin, and another example of the Guan Yin. This is a stucco. And my last slide, just to show you that we're not just imagining this, this is a contract, 1634, between a Japanese resident of Guadalajara, Mexico, which is Mexico's second largest city, with his Mexican partner, and this is a contract to make tequila. And you know what tequila is, right? <laughs> so this is a contract, the Japanese and his Mexican partner, and you can see the Japanese signature, uh, 1634. Thank you very much.